Hello and welcome to another episode of Science vs. the Ark Encounter. Today we continue looking into the claims made by Ken Ham in the Ark Encounter's Mars exhibit. There, Mr. Ham explains why do so many scientists reject a massive flood on Earth while accepting one on Mars. The truth is that the worldwide flood described in Genesis would completely undermine evolutionary beliefs about life on this planet. The rejection of the biblical flood is often due to evolutionary biases rather than the actual evidence. In fact, it is not a stretch to think that nearly every geologist would appeal to a global flood to explain many of Earth's features if the Bible had never mentioned such an event. Is it possible that Ken Ham is right? Could it really be that geologists all around the world have joined forces in a massive conspiracy against Ken Ham's interpretation of the Bible? Furthermore, who were the first geologists to realize that there is no geological evidence of a global flood? Were they evil evolutionists that hated the Bible? Or did they happen to be faithful Christians that simply cared about the scientific process and, as it turns out, actually made their discoveries before Darwin's theory of evolution was ever even published, meaning that Ken Ham's entire claim that scientists reject the flood because of evolutionary biases is, well, I don't want to spoil the entire video for you right here in the introduction, so continue watching to find out. All right, welcome back to another episode. John Perry here. It seems to me that when people talk about science and religion, especially on the internet, oftentimes they focus strictly on the conflicts that exist between science and religion. And that makes sense, I and mean, there are a fair amount of conflicts that do exist. But science and religion actually have a long history of cooperation. Hopefully you notice that the title of this video series is not Science versus Religion, it's not Science versus Christianity, it's Science versus the Ark Encounter. There's just specific things in there that are being taught that I, I think are very dishonest and need to be called out, need to be addressed. But my hope is that this video series so far has been something that anyone can enjoy, whether or not they are religious. Professionally, I have been involved in science education now for six years, and throughout that time, I've worked with a lot of scientists. In many cases, we've actually become friends and had personal conversations. We've even talked about the topic of religion. And I've been pretty surprised to see how much diversity of thought there is within the scientific community about religion. You know, some people are not religious at all. Others are driven to do their science because they feel that it is an act of worship. If you go back and take a look at the history of science, you will find that this idea, the idea that you can worship God by studying nature, this has been a driving force of science, especially in the early days. Now, when it comes to geology, historians will debate a little bit about when exactly modern geology first got its start, but most people will pin it back to Islam around the year 1000. They link it back to a man named Ibn Sina, and he was really interested in mountain formations and earthquakes. He was also really interested in Greek philosophy, particularly their concepts of logic. In the year 1020, he wrote a famous book called The Book of Healing. It talks about the importance of logic, careful inductive reasoning, how to critically and deeply examine natural phenomena, and how to conduct an experiment. In it, he says the following about the mountains. Either they are the effects of upheavals of the crust of the earth, such as might occur during a violent earthquake, or they are the effect of water which, cutting itself a new route, has denuded the valleys. The strata being of different kinds, some soft, some hard, it would require a long period of time for all such changes to be accomplished. In the 1600s, over in the Christian world, Nicholas Steno was a Danish bishop. He spent a lot of time studying nature and thinking about nature. For him, this was a major form of worship. And he's the guy that first put forth the law of superposition. This is the law that tells us that when you're looking at layers of rock, the layers of rock on top were laid down most recently, and the layers of rock at the bottom are the oldest. Pretty basic concept. I mean, that's it's obvious when you think about it, but nobody had ever articulated this, so far as we know, until he did. 
He also put forth the principle of original horizontality. And what that means is that when rock layers are laid down, they're laid down horizontally. So if you ever find rock layers that are tilted, that's because they were moved after forming. So some sort of an earthquake or you know tectonic event moved those rocks after they formed. The work of Nicholas Steno really did start a movement. A lot of people started studying geology, and most of the people at the time were clergymen. And actually, you know, even in like, you know, back in time a little bit, in the Middle Ages and, you know, up to the 1800s, pretty much the only way that you could be a scientist, the only way that you could study, have free time enough to study nature, is if you were either independently wealthy or you were a monk. You lived in a monastery. And so you your cost of living was next to zero and you had a lot of spare time to study books, translate books. Uh, study nature, and so on. When you read the works of these early scientists, it's really hard to figure out where the science starts and the religion ends. Everything's blended together. You know, a lot of people talk about the, the issues that Galileo had with the church, but for the most part, science and religion were buddies at that time. In the early 1800s, we see the formation of what is now regarded as the world's oldest geological society. It's the Geological Society of London. One of the geological society's earliest and most famous members was William Buckland. And he wrote a book in the 1820s called Observations on the Organic Remains Attesting to the Action of a Universal Deluge. By deluge, he means flood. And he's talking about the Noah's Ark flood. In the book, he lists out what he considers evidence for the flood, including the existence of flood gravels that are found on pretty much every continent. When a flood happens, of course, it moves lots of rocks around, and those pile up in flood gravels. It's really easy to tell when you're looking at a layer of rock that was built up by flood. And we find flood gravel all over the world. He also talks about seashells on the tops of mountains and so on and so forth. One of the people who read this book and loved this book was Reverend Adam Sedgwick. Reverend Sedgwick was also a geologist. He spent a lot of time studying rock formations. In fact, he eventually became the president of the Geological Society of London. And in his early days, he was completely convinced by Buckland's book. He promoted this idea far and wide, and he continued to do so when he became president of the Geological Society. But as president of the Geological Society, it was his job to really understand all of the research that was going on, really understand all of the discoveries that were being made. And so he dug in deep and he began to realize all sorts of issues with Buckland's arguments. Every year as president of the Geological Society, Adam Sedgwick would give an address to the entire society. They would meet once a year and talk about their discoveries. And in 1830, by the way, all of these talks were documented and you can read them. In 1830, he first began to publicly hint about his doubts about the evidence of the flood in geology. He explains that the flood gravels that we used to think all came from one giant flood seem to have come from multiple different local floods instead. The seashells that we're finding on the tops of mountains, well, it's not just seashells that we find. We find entire ecologies, giant fossilized coral reefs that could not have grown in just one year, which is how long the Bible says that the flood happened. What this suggested is that those mountains actually rose up from the seafloor to their current state today. So that was in 1830. In 1831, which was the last year of his presidency, knowing that it was his last year, his last chance at having this podium, he just kind of let loose. His entire talk from 1831 is online. You can read it. I've got a link to it in the video description, but here I'll just be reading a few select passages, some of the most important parts. So he starts out by saying, at our former anniversary, I ventured to affirm that our diluvial gravel was probably not the result of one, but many successive periods. So he's saying, you know, last year I was hinting that, you know, maybe the flood gravels didn't all come from one giant flood. But what I then stated as probable opinion may, after the essays of M.D. Beaumont, be now advanced with all of the authority of established truth. So here he's saying, yeah, I used to be fairly sure that the gravels were from different time periods, but now I'm, yeah, I'm definitely sure that those gravels are from different time periods. He goes on to say, 
In retreating where we have advanced too far, there is neither compromise of dignity nor loss of strength. For in doing this, we partake but of the common fortune of everyone who enters in a field of investigation like our own. I love the flowery speech of the 1800s. It's quite amusing. But, you know, here he's just saying, you know, I made a mistake and I made that mistake publicly. But this is just the nature of science. This is what happens. We come to conclusions, we find new things, and sometimes we find that our earlier conclusions were wrong. We get egg on our face from time to time. It's part of the job. Bearing upon this difficult question, there is, I think, one great negative conclusion now incontestably established, that the vast masses of diluvial gravel scattered almost over the surface of the earth do not belong to one violent and transitory period. It was indeed a most unwarranted conclusion when we assumed the contemporaneity of all the superficial gravel on the earth. So he's just reiterating, yeah, it was a mistake to assume that this was all just one thing. Then he goes on to explain why he jumped to that conclusion so easily. He says, We saw the clearest traces of diluvial action, of flood action, and we had in our sacred histories the record of a general deluge. On this double testimony it was that we gave a unity to a vast succession of phenomena, not one of which we perfectly comprehended, and under the name diluvium clashed them all together. So he's saying, I got excited because I saw the gravel and the rocks, and I saw the flood and the Bible, and I, I, jumped, I, I jumped the gun. Having been myself a believer and, to the best of my power, a propagator of what I now regard a philosophic heresy. Those are some harsh words. He's calling his, his previous claim that there is geological evidence of a flood. He's now calling that philosophic heresy. And having more than once been quoted for opinions I do not now maintain, I think it right, as one of my last acts before I quit the chair, before he ends his presidency, thus publicly to read my recantation. We ought indeed to have paused before we first adopted the Diluvian theory and referred to all our old superficial gravel to the action of the Mosaic Flood. And the part we're about to read now I think gets really interesting because he starts to talk about religion, the conflict between science and religion that's starting to form. Here he says, But are then the facts of our science opposed to the sacred records? And do we deny the reality of a historic deluge? I utterly reject such an inference. He continues to say that, you know, in the future, people will continue to look for signs of a giant flood. He calls them monuments of a flood. And he says, such monuments, at least, have not yet been found. And it is not perhaps intended that they ever should be found. That last part there is what I find most interesting. He's saying that, you know, maybe we're not finding evidence of a flood in geology because Maybe the Creator doesn't want us to have evidence. Maybe the Creator wants us to, uh, you know, act on faith. After all, Christianity is a religion of faith. I highly recommend looking in the video description for the link to this book. His full talk is really good. You should read it. It's really interesting to read science back then because, as mentioned before, it's, it's really difficult to tell where the science starts and the religion ends. You don't really start to see a division between science and religion, a really clear division between these two different projects until scientists branch out and start working with each other across cultures. So in England at this time, geology was pretty much just a Christian European thing. They weren't working with Muslims, they weren't working with Hindus or Buddhists. But once these scientists started branching out and working with researchers from other continents and other cultures, they stopped talking about God so much. Science today can be defined as the careful collection and documentation of observable facts and an ongoing conversation about what those facts might mean. And because the various gods that people believe in their religions tend to be uh, invisible, they don't show themselves, they can't actually be studied and discussed within the scientific community because they're just, I mean, there's, nothing, there's nothing to observe, right? And I imagine that unless someone is able to find something real, something concrete that actually can be observed, science and religion will remain separated indefinitely. So Reverend Adam Sedgwick gave that talk in 1831. Charles Darwin did not publish his theory of evolution until 1859. Now, let me be really clear. Scientists realized that there is no geological evidence for a global flood before Darwin's theory of evolution ever existed. Furthermore, the people that made this discovery, they were Bible-believing Christians. 
These are extremely well-documented facts of history. Now let's see what Ken Ham has to say. Again, this is one of the plaques in his Mars exhibit, which we discussed uh, on last week's episode. Why do so many scientists reject a massive flood on Earth while accepting one on Mars? The truth is that the worldwide flood described in Genesis would completely undermine evolutionary beliefs about life on this planet. The rejection of the biblical flood is often due to evolutionary biases rather than the actual evidence. In fact, it is not a stretch to think that nearly every geologist would appeal to a global flood to explain many of Earth's features if the Bible had never mentioned such an event. So there you have it. That is the wisdom of Ken Ham. I don't think that I even have to bother explaining and pointing out the contradictions at this point. You people are very smart. You can figure that out. If you've been watching this video series, in the first couple of videos, I showed that the exhibits produced by Ken Ham oftentimes contradict the actual observations that have been made in science. In the last video, I pointed out that Ken Ham's exhibits sometimes contradict Ken Ham's other exhibits, and now we see that Ken Ham's exhibits also contradict really well-documented historical facts. If you have been watching this video series from the start and you are still convinced that Ken Ham is someone worth listening to, I really don't know what else I can say to you. I, I, I honestly, I, I don't. I will continue doing this video series. I've got a couple more videos that I want to do, but by now it should be pretty obvious what's going on here. If you happen to have specific questions about evolution that you would like me to answer on this uh, YouTube channel, you can contact me on my website at statedclearly.com. Send me a message, let me know what question you'd like me to address, and I'm doing a series called 113 Questions About Evolution. Now, I'll, a lot of the questions I already have, people have been asking me questions for years, but especially if I get the same or a similar question from multiple different people, I'll address that question right away. So go ahead and make sure that you are subscribed to my YouTube channel and feel free to leave me messages on my website or here in the video comments and I will try my best to get to your questions. So long for now, stay curious.